Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. It's so nice to see all of you back. Um, this is the our first meeting since we adjourned in how many months ago or weeks ago in um, at the end of June. And so this is the meeting of the House Appropriations Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee is also joining us to hear. Uh, Commissioner, where are you, Commissioner Gresham? I'm looking around my Hollywood Squares box. There you are. Um, to hear the governor's um, proposal for the continuation of the FY21 budget. As we all remember, we did a quarter year budget and this will screw up any uh, any needed adjustments within 20 in that first quarter in 21, but also be the full year uh, budget for the year 21. This is the governor's recommendation and then um, we will hear from Commissioner Gresham and then start our work um, um, as the as the uh, plans a version of the F21 budget. Welcome committee members, welcome Ways and Means members. Um, Representative Ansel, Chair of Ways and Means, I'm looking for you on the screen. I heard your voice. Here. There you are. Uh, did you have anything you would like to say before we get started? No, just uh, appreciate the uh, inviting us to join you. I assume that we'll drop we'll we'll drop off at two thirty after we finish the basic uh, presentation. But if people from the committee want to stay, um, I assume that that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to be sure everybody on Ways and Means had got the link um, to the documents. It looks I think Perfect. we did. So um, so thank you. And we'll thank you, Janet. And Thirty. What we had scheduled was to complete um, the presentation with Commissioner Gresham, which we may complete before that, and then we had 15 minutes so the our committee and your committee could exchange uh, any questions or anything that we wanted um, additional information on. So we'll just see where we end up, but we have that last 15 minutes scheduled. Great. Thank you. So Commissioner Gresham, you have uh, with you uh, Matt Riven and. Is there anyone else from the administration that is joining you today? Uh, the two of us will um, will take it from here. Excellent. So we have several documents from you. And if you would just always uh, remind us which document you're working off sure. of so can shuffle them around. And we're excited to hear <laughs> uh, your presentation. Uh, I'm take happy to screen share as well. Uh, yes, that would be. Um, would you prefer to screen share? Yes. Well, I actually, so Teresa, would you, um, will you handle that? I, I'll be um, referring to, uh, it's called the uh, general fund overview dated 8-18-20. Um, that may be the, the um, best one to put up there. But, uh, and while she um, gets it up there, maybe I would just start with uh, a couple of uh, introductory remarks. Uh, my colleague, Matt Riven, is also with us, as the chair pointed out. Um, so I, I would say probably the most um, notable part of this budget um, is that there's uh, really very little change. If uh, someone were not, and I realize I'm speaking to somewhat of a wonkish audience, but were you not a wonkish audience and you were just the man and the woman in the street um, that um, took advantage of services or, or programs that the government um, oversees, you would not notice a difference in this budget versus the one that the governor presented in, um, in January. Uh, it is uh, very similar and that's purposeful. Uh, we tried to do that. Uh, we did not think that now is the time to make any dramatic changes um, in any uh, dramatic turns. I think it's particularly appropriate that um, the uh, Appropriations Committee uh, and the Women's Means are hearing this together because, you know, I would argue that this budget is a much of, as much about kind of revenue and, and um, revenue changes as it is about appropriations and appropriations changes. In fact, probably the more dramatic uh, changes between uh, January of this year and this month are revenue as opposed to appropriation. 
Um, you will not notice, uh, as I said, major changes. One thing we did not do is we did not use reserves. Uh, that is quite a bit, I, I'd say quite a bit different from what I was thinking, you know, six weeks, two months ago, uh, we were dealing with uh, a substantially different revenue environment. We thought uh, things changed in the uh, past month and uh, two months. So uh, we now realize we do not need to use reserves. Uh, you won't see any reduction in critical programs. You won't see any reduction in critical services. Uh, like I said, it's predominantly a steady as you go status quo budget um, that you will uh, be looking at. You will, however, uh, see the use of uh, one-time money that typically in, in budgets we do not use, particularly for base spending. Um, and I'll explain um, kind, of, kind of where we uh, achieve that and how we do that. Uh, but, you know, the concept really is that uh, uh, hope <laughs> and prayer, we are dealing with a one-time event, a pandemic. We don't intend to be dealing with this over the long term. That's, um, I hope we won't be, but it's a one-time event. And we thought that um, to deal with that, we would also use revenue that we have available one time, assuming that in future years, revenue will rebound um, back towards base level. Uh, we know that won't happen next year, uh, but we do anticipate in future years we'll get back to a more normal revenue stream. So we do use uh, one-time revenue, and uh, I'll explain um, exactly um, how we do that. But I thought, you know, just to start off, um, kind of taking it from the top, uh, if you look at the uh, top line of this table, uh, that lay the, uh, what we call current law revenue that we use. Um, those of you who uh, either were at or listened into the uh, emergency board meeting last week will recognize these numbers. Um, in, in January, the governor presented a budget that uh, used current law revenue of just under $1.6 billion, which one five nine six. When we were in the middle of the pandemic, you know, kind of looking out and, and seeing the, uh, you know, virtual uh, shut off of the Vermont economy as well as the national economy. Uh, we looked at a revenue outlook uh, that was uh, updated last June 8th, looking at about a $218 million general fund shortfall. Uh, subsequently, um, in July, when, <clears throat> when deferred tax revenues, deferred tax payments came in, and the economy seemed to uh, refine its uh, footing. Uh, we uh, revenue estimates increased or went up. And last week, the emergency board um, consensus was on the revenue figure you see in front of you, the $1.414 billion. So that is the current law we are budgeting on. Add to that direct apps, direct applications, and property transfer tax revenue. It's kind of an interesting um, story here in that the um, kind of maybe counterintuitively in a challenging environment, uh, the direct applications actually over the uh, past two or three months have picked up. Um, or we've been able to um, send more or revert more to the general fund than we anticipated um, even a month or two ago, certainly in January. Um, what that means is that some of our funds um, that um, generate revenue and that we draw upon for the general fund uh, had more uh, to contribute than we thought. Notably, uh, in unclaimed property, um, there was an extra million and a half, two million there um, in the uh, DFR. Uh, fund uh, through uh, licensing of insurance companies, broker dealers and the like. Uh, there was more revenue there than we anticipated, about $2 million. And in addition, in uh, liquor, liquor and lottery, um, there was a higher direct applications than we had anticipated uh, as a result of um, you know, people's activities during the pandemic. So that actually is a good story. The property transfer tax, the revenue uh, projection was a bit weaker um, than originally it was in January, um, which resulted in a small amount of leakage. However, uh, that was uh, made up for and more um, by a, um, a, a slightly smaller amount um, to be turned over to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Um, so 
uh, the net of uh, direct apps and property transfer tax uh, was $95 million, which was about $7 million more than we had anticipated in January. The total, uh, the total, <laughs> the total um, uh, current law and direct apps and the like is um, about $1.509 billion. Um, so that is our total base rate. Now, the um, unusual uh, part of this year uh, as you will see of the lines directly below, uh, there is a prior year surplus, uh, which again was um, uh, the subject of a fair amount of conversation last week at joint fiscal as well as the emergency board. And there's also some more reversions than are typical um, in a budget. Uh, the prior year surplus resulted from uh, predominantly two factors. Uh, you'll recall uh, this committee um, had a, a, a very unusual second budget adjustment last year uh, that we worked on in uh, May, and I believe the governor signed in early June. Uh, that was done kind of the height of the pandemic uh, when our revenue uh, forecast was uh, not as, uh, as it is today. And we thought that we needed to, to move. We needed to um, to uh, reduce spending and, and look at different revenue sources and you know, really, I think that's one of the great things about this state that when we, you know, have uh, issues, uh, we get together and we deal with them rather than wait. And so we had a second budget adjustment. Uh, the net of that, as uh, the committees will remember, was about $84 million uh, that we saved from the general fund. In addition, uh, the second, uh, I think, contributor to the uh, surplus was, uh, frankly, the revenues that um, were norm in normal years would have been paid in April, tax revenues in April, as well as in um, May and June, um, uh, estimated taxes, as well as uh, sales and use and, and purchase and use and the like. Uh, those payments were deferred predominantly until July. Not all of them, by the way, not everyone elected to defer payments. Some people paid right along as they should. Um, other people took the uh, federal and the state government up on the ability to defer, and so they made their payments in July. When those payments came in, not only did they come in at forecast, but in fact, they came in above forecast, um, which was a pleasant surprise. Um, maybe in hindsight, we should not have um, uh, anticipated that a pandemic in you know, the first part of 2020 would affect what happened in 2019. Uh, 2019 is a very good year. Tax payments were uh, very hardy. Um, and so combination of raising money during the budget adjustment as well as um, tax payments above forecast resulted in a substantial surplus of um, just under $130 million for uh, fiscal 20, which we're carrying forward into fiscal 21 to help us um, achieve balance in this budget. Um, the other uh, interesting uh, um, occurrence in 20, um, was uh, the uh, March to June quarter um, during the pandemic, many um, parts of government were either curtailed or shut down. Um, and that resulted, uh, as you might imagine, in more savings um, than we anticipated. Um, and that showed up in terms of carry forward. Uh, so um, things, you know, simple things like uh, travel budgets, you know, people have budgets to go to meetings and to travel in state and out of state and those obviously um, uh, were not used during the uh, March to June quarter. So there was some travel budgets, um, you know, state parks were open later than normal. So seasonal uh, workers were higher later. Um, certain grants and uh, for, uh, weren't fully distributed because uh, they, they, they were not applicable at the time. So anyway, uh, that resulted in a uh, carry forward number of just under $60 million of leftover uh, uh, appropriations authority from FY20. A little under half of that, $28 million, we reverted to the general fund. Um, that's a, a almost half. That's much higher than it typically is. Not only were carry forwards probably four times what they normally were, uh, but the reversion of 50% of carry forwards is also somewhat unusual um, to, you know, I think in line with the unusual period. So the combination of a prior year surplus and um, 28 of uh, carry forward reversions, uh, uh, approximately $158 million um, of 
one-time money that we can add to our base revenue uh, to help us um, uh, achieve the uh, um, uh, revenue to meet um, expenses. Uh, there were two small deductions. Um, people are familiar with um, the FY21 budget as well as I think every budget that the governor uh, has submitted uh, will be familiar with the military pension tax exemption request. Um, that is in this budget too, as well the uh, downtown and village tax center or center downtown center tax credit, uh, which was also in the FY20 budget uh, and will be in this or is in this restatement. So that's a, a revenue deduct of uh, roughly 2.7 million. So in constructing the budget, we're drawing on 1.664 uh, billion dollars. We started uh, with base appropriations, which include the Pay Act of 1683. Um, and then here are some changes that also are unusual for our time period, but they helped us get to balance. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I think this budget is a much of, is a much is as much about revenue uh, and how we achieved it as it is about appropriations. And you know, one. I think um, fairly substantial difference this year is as you see funding source changes. Uh, people remember that during the uh, January through June of this year, the last two quarters of FY20, the federal government stepped up and uh, provided an enhanced um, federal match for Medicaid expenditures. Uh, that FMAP bump was a little over 6%, I think it was 6.2%. And that was part of the budget adjustment um, in May and June. Um, that was roughly, I think, then $38 million uh, for the January through June period. Uh, we are, uh, we know uh, that that uh, enhanced uh, federal match uh, will be in effect through September 30th of this year. And we project that it will be um, in effect through December 31st. Uh, in that projection, we are in very good company. Many states have made the same uh, have come to the same conclusion, and we're reasonably confident of that. Uh, so the the combined um, uh, Q1 and Q2 of fiscal 21 uh, enhanced federal match um, will be uh, slightly under $40 million uh, of money that, um, federal money that we're putting um, into our Medicaid program, and we are drawing out the general fund um, in that. Um, so that, you know, net net represents a general fund decline. In addition, the second source of funding that I would is we, there were some, there are some payments um, in the restatement um, that represent uh, coronavirus relief fund money uh, that we have uh, notably in a couple of human service departments uh, mental health corrections and children and families. Um, that's uh, in and around $10 million of money that um, is coronavirus relief fund money that is generally drawing out. So there were some funding source changes which represent a decline in general fund spending, uh, which were very helpful to us in getting to balance. Um, I mentioned earlier that we did not make any um, notable changes in programs, um, services. Uh, you know, one, I think, interesting part of this budget, and, you know, when we were kind of, when the dust settled and we were looking at the numbers of uh, department spending and the like, um, one notable uh, or interesting part was that program spending is actually up in this restatement relative to where it was um, in January. And, um, you know, I think there are two uh, or maybe three main contributors to that. Uh, first, uh, as folks who were present at the emergency board last week, you'll remember there was a slight adjustment to the consensus Medicaid forecast. Um, I believe uh, the gross number was, I think, 12 to $15 million. Uh, the net to the general fund was about $5 million. Um, so that's, um, Part pro that's you'll see reflected in program changes. Uh, there was also a projection of higher reach up um, caseloads. Uh, we've benefited over the past really three or four years with steady declining um, reach up 
case loads and we're um, thinking uh, that that will reverse itself this year. Um, so there was uh, uh, there is higher reach up uh, case load in our um, program uh, spending. In addition, there's a um, one program in Department of Public Safety that some of you may be aware of uh, that we are um, continuing in this restatement. In fact, we're augmenting in this restatement. You may remember in the uh, governor's original recommend in January, there was a, a, a mental health uh, caseworker that was um, integrated into public safety. You know, the idea being um, that uh, state police should have more access to mental health professionals. Um, and our goal was to have at least one mental health professional per police barracks. Um, so we, we started small in the um, January uh, statement. And um, in this budget, you'll see almost, um, I think there are another uh, six uh, full-time equivalent uh, mental health caseworkers um, that are integrated into state police. We believe it's a, a necessary program. I believe the legislature uh, was in agreement on that, but we think it's, you know, it's time to continue to roll that out. Uh, but that also is a pressure. So in total, when you add these together, there's about $9 million of upward pressure in programs. The, uh, the departmental changes number is, um, you know, a little bit, it's, it, there's a lot of moving parts to it and the why it kind of washes out to uh, very little change, but, you know, kind of underlying um, that 0.4 number are um, a number of changes both up and down. Um, <laughs> in terms of the, the down, um, one um, request we made of departments uh, when we were going into this budget is we were going to try to achieve savings and in internal service funds. Uh, this is always a challenge. Um, you know, the internal service funds are kind of what departments use to run themselves. I mean, you know, it's everything from heat and electricity to mowing the lawn to data storage, um, you know, different property management, uh, human resources, and, and frankly, finance and management. Um, many of our, um, our expenses are through internal service fund. So, uh, you know, we, but we told departments that um, were, um, uh, paid for through internal service funds. They had to find savings and departments um, stepped up. So there's a 5% savings internal service funds, which is about two and a half million dollars net, uh, which I think was very helpful. Um, there were uh, small changes here and there uh, that um, also contributed. Um, there was also an, uh, there was a, a, an increase um, in um, department costs in human services, largely involved with Woodside taking some of the savings out that were uh, originally in the FY21 budget. Um, but the net of the um, departmental savings and program changes and funding sources brought our total base appropriations down to 1.644. Um, so, you know, we're, we were, we're, we're getting to where we need to be in that regard. Um, there are a number of one-time appropriations um, that, um, have to do um, that are involved with governor's initiative and, and that we will uh, talk to you about. Um, some of them that I would highlight uh, would be there's um, about six million dollars uh, that goes to the agency of transportation. A million of that goes to town highway aid. Another million goes to you know maintenance and roadside mowing. We've received a fair amount of feedback um, and that was unfortunately uh, one of the reductions uh, we had to make uh, when we uh, ran into a lower uh, projected revenue for transportation. Uh, many people have taken notice. Uh, the governor has wanted to um, you know, change that. And so with some of the um, excess that we've had in the general fund, we're going to send it to transportation to um, boost their uh, maintenance and roadside mowing program. There's also $4 million in this budget uh, sent to AOT uh, for additional leveling and paving to try to get uh, the upper hand uh, on some of our uh, road surfaces. Um, there's a little over Adam, a million dollars. Yes. Adam, it may just a clarification. So within that 6.4, 10 million of it is being transferred to the transportation fund out of the general fund? Uh, 6 million. 
Oh, I thought you said an additional four million for paving. Yes, of that six million, there's a million oh, that goes to maintenance and roadside, a million to town yeah. highway aid. I thought the four million was an additional on the six. Thank you. Um, there are a few other initiatives I would highlight. Um, one is to the Public Service Department uh, for grants to distribute to CUDS, the Communication Union Districts uh, for broadband rollout. I mean, that, that I think um, no mystery. This is something that uh, the governor um, has been pushing as well as the legislature. And so we're trying to keep the momentum going in that. Um, and also um, there is a, a $2 million um, allocation for uh, what we would call economic stimulus equity. Um, as many people know, the, um, the uh, federal government distributed to many people um, stimulus checks up to um, $1,200. Uh, those checks didn't go to everyone. Um, and so uh, we're acknowledging that and where this is really what I would call more of a placeholder to start a dialogue with the legislature about how we can um, you know, kind of equalize um, the stimulus payments to um, sectors of our economy uh, that did not receive it. Uh, but we think it's an important initi initiative and we look forward to speaking with you guys more about that. So that's kind of a, a, a brief overview of, of the, um, some of the uh, extras uh, that you'll see in this budget. Um, you know, filling up, there were um, actually a kind of a, um, one of the few bright spots, I guess you might say, from uh, living through this uh, pandemic is um, with the decline in the general fund that represented a, a small savings in our um, stabilization reserve contribution requirement. Um, so you notice that that went down a little bit. But in total, um, uh, appropriations and transfers, um, the recommended restatement um, comes out at 1664, um, or just under, um, which as you can see is a, a decline from the original budget that was uh, recommended in January. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's um, a reasonable budget that um, you know continues the programs that we have, um, that, that are important to Vermonters um, and that we believe in. Um, I will, however, I, finish with one um, one more comment that is kind of a premonition of uh, what we'll see in FY22. Um, and that is that um, if you recall um, at the e-board last week, um, Jeff Carr and Tom Cavett uh, not only forecast revenue for this year, but they also forecasted for FY22. And the FY22 forecast will be the forecast upon which we build our FY22 uh, governor's recommended budget. Um, and that number um, for total current law revenue, if you look at the top line of this uh, law revenue, the number that is the FY22 number is 1508, which by coincidence is almost equal to our total base revenue this year. The 1508 number, um, if you just um, add, say, $100 million of direct apps and property transfer and the like, um, comes out to be about you know, 1608 or 1610, just for round numbers. Um, that compares, uh, that's still um, about 60 or $55 million less than what this year's total appropriations and transfers are. Um, so we know that we will be going into FY22 with, um, you know, a, um, a challenge. And, you know, that probably represents the best look today at what the challenge may be. Keep in mind that uh, that, uh, that 55 or $60 million deficit does not account for typical pressures, say more caseload pressures, um, retirement contributions, we don't know what those will be, uh, cost of living allowance for state employees and the like. Um, so, you know, we're, we're acknowledging and uh, we're sober about the fact that uh, we face a challenge next year. 
It may well be, you know, like this year that there are other pools of money that we can draw on. Um, it may well be that the federal government steps up um, or um, it may well be that, you know, the economy um, you know, bounces back stronger than we think. Anything could happen. Um, but, you know, as of today, this is what we face and um, it's something that we, you know, we feel that we will be um, spending a fair amount of time this fall dealing with. So that was a pretty whirlwind go through, but I, I thought I would leave a fair amount of time for questions and uh, that you may have. Thank you, thank you, Adam, for this overview. It's a pretty high level overview. Before we open it to questions, I'm wondering if you would like to highlight a few initiatives that, um, that maybe the, the committee would be interested in, either our committee or Ways and Means. Um, that we're you know into the bit of a deeper dive of, of the pieces that helped you uh, balance this budget. I, I do real. I, I asked um, uh, well, to look over some some of uh, some. Of, I've been I've been trying to look over some of the documents, but I realize there's a change in the community high school of Vermont funding, and I I was you know, I would like if you could expound a little bit more on changes to the li uh, lottery. It appears that that has been expanded, the definition of the lottery, but I, I haven't been able to find where the additional money is reflected or if that would come in in 22. That's in section 236. Right. Um, so if there's just some areas that, uh, that, that are initiatives of the governor like to highlight for us, I, I think that would be helpful. And then we would open to questions. Sure, um, taking that um, in order, um, the, uh, your first question, community high school, um, that um, resides as it did in the uh, FY21 budget that resides in the education fund. Um, I realize uh, that is a, often a topic um, that the uh, legislature deals with, but that is in the education fund where it has been for a number of years. Um, it is taken out, I think a couple of years ago and we're advocating putting it back in as part of a uh, cradle to career education. Um, you will also, um, some of you may remember that there was a um, CCFAP initiative uh, that was in the education fund and that was going to be funded um, by an expansion of the lottery to Keno. Uh, that is not on the table. Uh, that was taken back because um, we are not advocating for uh, Keno um, in this time. However, uh, to answer uh, the chair's question, uh, there is an initiative on iLottery and sports betting. It is something that uh, sports betting, I think, has been um, a topic of conversation in the State House uh, this year. And prior years uh, is something the governor uh, would like to uh, make happen in Vermont, as well as I lottery, uh, which you know has a younger demographic and it's very popular. Um, but we were not comforting revenue estimates uh, in uh, for those two, in part because of the time that it will take to actually fully launch um, the uh, those proposals. So. There's, and there may be some revenue that comes in towards the latter part of FY21, um, but we, we just didn't feel confident enough to put that into our revenue forecast. So you'll see the initiative um, in the budget, but there is no revenue component to that. Thank you. That's why I couldn't find a number. Thank you. Right, well. yeah. Um, so, uh, and kind of continuing along those lines, um, there are, um, some um, uh, asks from uh, the uh, coronavirus relief fund uh, that you'll see in the language um, that are um, predominantly not part of the main budget. In other words, um, they're not helping us achieve balance. Uh, they would be uh, extra initiatives. Uh, there are a few um, that are in the budget, notably DCF reach up, corrections, and mental health is about a $400,000 allocation to the Agency of uh, Agriculture, Farm, and Markets, uh, in part to, or in large part, to help them uh, run 
um, the, the economic grant programs, the four different programs that they're supposed to um, that I think are reasonable to Adam, um, may, point out. Adam, yes. you may want to shut your video up. We missed an important piece about the uh, agriculture. You, your your um, words, we could see you, but your words went out. Okay. So um, what I was going to mention is there are some requests in this document um, uh, for a coronavirus relief fund uh, funding. Um, some of those requests are in the budget as a, uh, by that I mean that they are replacing general fund spending. I mentioned them earlier um, the, it, within DCF, uh, DCF reach up corrections and mental health as well as uh, about $400,000 in the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Uh, and that uh, ag um, allocation from the uh, relief fund uh, is to offset the cost of administering the four different programs that the agency is administering for economic grants. You may remember from um, the uh, coronavirus relief fund bills that were passed at the end of the session. But there are additional requests in there that you will see. Most notably, uh, there is a $133 million request uh, for economic development grant program carried out through ACCD. And in this, the governor is saying that we have revenue uh, in the uh, relief fund that has not been allocated, uh, that was um, left uh, for various uh, either initiatives or revenue replacement or uh, perhaps to replace um, appropriations that are deemed ineligible. But there was a number of reasons why there was money left on the bottom line. Uh, we're now the third week of August. Uh, we have till the end of the year to spend it. And we think it's um, important um, to lay down um, some uh, requests uh, or some uh, purpose for that money. So um, there's um, $133 million of economic development money that uh, ACCD will be uh, very happy to come in and talk to you about. Um, and there are also a number of uh, different allocations uh, that predominantly uh, deal with running uh, the government services that we run uh, under a COVID environment. So if you look through the language, you will see them there. Um, there is also some, uh, what I would call waterfall language to the extent that the uh, federal government changes eligibility requirements um, or to the extent that there is money that um, comes back to the relief fund either because appropriations were deemed ineligible or in the, uh, to the extent that there is additional money uh, added uh, uh, from Congress later on this year. But we wanted to make sure that we noted certain uh, appropriations that we feel would be good uh, for a uh, good use of this money. Included in there, I would note, um, is $30 million for the Vermont State Colleges that we believe that, you know, we have uh, more flexibility to use the money that we have, or if more additional uh, revenue comes in um, that we uh, um, uh, were put to. So, uh, you know, you can, uh, I would leave that for your uh, reading pleasure. Uh, but I did want to make sure you um, make sure to note that. Um, but I, you know, I reviewed the um, governor's initiatives you'll see in there, um, and I should mention that as part of the initiatives um, I mentioned earlier. But I'll repeat: um, there were a couple of uh, tax um, programs in there, the downtown and village center tax credits, as well as the military retirement income tax credits. Uh, that have been featured in other budgets that the governor has submitted. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Um, and, and just for clarification, the military number that, that is being <clears throat> shown, the 1.4, that's not for a full year, is it? That would be a half year? Would the full amount of the military tax credit be 2.8 million? Is yes, that would be for 12 months. This is for six months. A six months. Okay. I just so the committee knows. So let's open it up to questions. Ways and Means Committee, please um, use your, you have a virtual hand. If you have a question, we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, Representative Lanford. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So underneath that flexibility of that 44 million <clears throat> that you have listed as to possible ways of funding 
some of those things that, that many of us have found very important. Um, is it my understanding then that the 30 million, that there's no money in the governor's budget for bridge funding for the state colleges or the National Guard tuition, or is this just how you might be able to pay for it if something changes? Uh, there is no um, funding in the main budget for the uh, bridge Those funding for the Vermont State Colleges. I would note that their base funding is $30 million, and they also received a $5 million bridge loan. Uh, and the governor, you know, is committed to the state college system. Yes. And if we can find more uh, flexibility from Congress or more money comes to the state, we uh, would certainly consider as one of the main priorities um, providing funding for the state colleges. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Jessup. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Adam, could you please speak to how the administration is handling year two of the PAY Act? Uh, the administration has not addressed that yet. And that is uh, certainly something that we will address when we do the FY22 budget. But, you know, we are committed to the uh, agreement that we signed. Um, and we will deal with that when we do the 22 budget. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. We have uh, Representative Helm and then Hooper. Okay. Adam, um, thank you. Uh, can we go back to colleges just for a minute? And can you talk to me more about that $30 million? Where is that coming from and what is it used for? Or are you talking about their annual allotment that we've been giving them plus a little bit every year? Uh, no, this is not, this does not deal with their annual appropriation. We are making no changes to what um, the governor submitted in January. Uh, they receive, I think it's, $29.8 million in the right. FY21 uh, budget, and they received the same amount in the restatement. This would be additional funding for the state colleges. As many of you know, there's now a study um, committee or commission going on looking into the future of the state colleges. Uh, there are any number of decisions they have to make. Um, and we think that um, the, we certainly uh, believe, and the governor certainly believes that we need a, a, a thriving um, state college system, um, but they are in the middle of, of studying where they'll be in future years. And we're happy to um, provide funding if there is additional funding available and additional flexibility on the use of our existing funding uh, um, towards the state colleges. But this has nothing to do with the appropriation that we provide annually in the uh, budget. This would be an answer. So what, what, are there any strings attached to this $30 million? What, what is that to be used for? Well, one of the, as you're aware, the, there was a request from the state colleges uh, for additional funding to meet what they anticipate will be a substantial operating deficit. Um, and so in part, I think this would be to help them uh, bridge that um, deficit, um, but I, you know I, I can't say more than that. So, oh, all right. I, I guess then I'm going to assume there's no strings attached. They can use it to pay their bills or whatever they feel the need is. What need is necessary? I would right. say that if we get to the point when we can make an appropriation um, to the state colleges that we would want to speak with the legislature about what they anticipate or, or what they would like to, this would be a dialogue. Um, right now, we just wanted to acknowledge that we have an interest there, um, that we don't have the funding for it, but we haven't forgotten. All right, well, you know, and I'll finish in just a second, but I, I worry because as we progress further and further beyond the beginning of COVID-19, and as it becomes as a little bit rested from what it was, if that's a good word, back in March, I'm hearing terms like, if available, if the money's available, and things like that. I hear that in conversations here and there. 
and it's telling me, watch out, there's a, there's a shift here in the air that might not be the best thing for Vermont State Colleges. We know, I think, how financially strapped they are. I, I don't, what I think we don't know is, what I, I'm going to assume is colleges are not going to be the same as they were ever again. They're going back and they're going to go back to heavily online. It's my opinion, but I believe it's going to start a change that will change the whole uh, way the colleges function. And, and they're going to need, they're going to need dollars to deal with this because they're on a national stage, as you know. Um, I just want to put that on record as being said. It frightens me that as we get, we're going to get crunched down for the next two or three years. And as we do, we're going to backpedal our first statements. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Bob. Um, I would like to continue on Vermont State Colleges. There's several hands up so that Adam doesn't bounce from there to tax expenditures to, you know, DCF. Other state college questions so that um, and Mary, you, you were next. Is yours a state college or a to different topic? Okay, then we'll just continue. Mary, and then it's Dave, yeah. Marty, it, and... Yeah. I, I raised my hand for state colleges, and then Adam said something else, but uh, I will put that aside for a moment. I wrote myself a note, so I'll try to remember. Um, what I am inferring from the budget overview that you have presented to us is that it is not the governor's first priority to provide the $30 million in bridge funding. And in fact, I mean, the, the way this is structured is based on the assumption that the feds will give us some leeway at a later date. I'm, and I, I think that's a fair way of restating what you told us. I'm really concerned about what that means in terms of the messages that we are sending to that community and to the communities that host the state colleges. Um, we already watched them have a, um, a down in enrollments because of the uh, former chancellor's announcement that of, of his proposal to close. Um, and this has such a profound kind of knock on effect in, in our communities. I mean, and so I'm deeply worried and I would like to know what the administration's plan is for supporting Randolph, Johnson, Linden, um, in, in making sure that those communities um, don't see just a real loss of employment, property taxes, you know, retail activity, the list goes on and on. So what, what is the, the state's strategy for addressing this if we do not provide the bridge funding? Well, look, I make a couple of comments. First, the governor signed happily um, the Q1 budget that included um, some bridge funding for the state colleges. Um, that was not something he was unhappy about. Um, he believes it was a good idea. Uh, he also uh, believes that it's a good idea that there is a commission of wise men and women who are studying uh, what should happen to the state colleges. We all have opinions. I have mine and I'm sure you have yours, uh, but there's a, a commission of people who are looking at all the angles um, and coming out with a recommendation. Um, so rather than front running that, I think it's a good idea uh, to stand back and listen to what they have to say and then form conclusions. Uh, and those conclusions will be um, both subjective and, or, uh, you know, um, be financial as well as policy driven. So, it, you know, it's not as if we're doing nothing and it's not as if we have little care. And uh, to the contrary, I think the governor and the administration is deeply 
um, you know, caring about the state colleges. And there is a process that is being followed. There are, uh, you know, a number of people who are looking at um, the different options, and we anticipate a report. We just don't want to front run it. So thank you. And you. we obviously thought that it was important that the, a group of experts be brought together. Be, that's the reason we set up that structure. Uh, so you disagree with the um, report that we have received uh, that was an analysis of the system that we need $30 million on the order of $30 million to bridge us to what that report, that group of experts tell us what we need to do? Uh, I don't disagree with that. I don't have an opinion on that. Okay. So there, there is a view that we need to have the $30 million as a bridge to get us to whatever the other side is of supporting the state colleges. I think you Mary, agree with me. Yeah. Question? Thank you. No. Thank you, Mary. I have uh, Dave, Marty, Maida, and then Representative Ansel. Thank you. Uh, I just want to underscore the point that uh, Mary made and, and Bob, and I think uh, Diane alluded to too. It's still not clear to me being happy about finding some money. Uh, for short term, a short a brief amount, a short amount for uh, bridge is one thing, but leaving it up in the air to me is, is very troubling. The, the report that's being done, I think we'll get a portion of it in December, and then the balance of it, I think, comes sometimes in, in uh, calendar year 21. And yet, um, the, the system will need money far before then. This feels to me like a lifeline that's a few yards short of the people that are in the ocean bobbing around and needing help and it's it's troublesome and I don't mean to be disrespectful I appreciate all the challenges but this is not uh, it doesn't feel very definitive to me it feels up in the air would the governor be willing uh, assuming the CRF funds can't be used and and you're stated uh, you stated twice I think commissioner that the governor uh, feels the state college is very important would he be willing to use some of our reserve funds to build that bridge to keep them um, uh, going as we continue these conversations? So our first hope would be that we uh, would be given additional either revenue or flexibility from DC. And uh, second, yes, I think the governor would be willing to use reserves if necessary. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank somebody, you somebody has a bird chirping. It's a cricket in my room. It's a cricket in your room. <laughs> I thought it was in my room, Marty, because there was a chipmunk that's in the house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it's loud. Mar um, no, he Marty. <laughs> uh, along the same lines, I'm, I'm not concerned at all about the governor's commitment nor the legislature's commitment in order to figure out what we need to do for the state colleges. My only concern is that this $30 million is in this second category that's called if flexibility. Can, can you explain what clarification we would need in order to feel comfortable that the CRF funds could be used for this? What is the uncertainty about that? And I'll turn off my cricket. <laughs> well, I, I think the uh, original uncertainty, which still holds, is that there uh, was a prohibition in the original guidelines against revenue replacement. And there was a requirement that what had to, uh, that the revenue from, or the, the money from the coronavirus relief fund had to be used for COVID related um, issues. And you know, taking a look at it, and I think wise men and women in the administration, as well as in uh, the legislature, have looked at that and are doubtful that the coronavirus relief fund money, as it is now directed, uh, uh, would be uh, state colleges would be an eligible use. So clarity from uh, Washington uh, that this money can be used as the state sees fit 
or for greater purpose or more purposes than currently are allowed. Um, but it would be, we're looking for clarity that $30 million would not be put to the state colleges and then clawed back again um, because it's deemed ineligible. Um, really the uh, restrictions, I think, on the use of the um, relief fund uh, prohibit the use of plugging or bridging a $30 million budget gap, but that may change. So uh, I think we'll know it when we see it. So, so we're just waiting to see if they come through with different guidelines or are we actively seeking some guidelines that would make us feel far more comfortable? Well, we and many other states have asked for greater leeway. I mean, one thing, one thing I would note is under current guidelines, this money needs to be spent by the end of the year. I think December 30th was the date. And so, you know, putting $30 million into any institution, not just state colleges, uh, and having it sit in the bank um, as it's used progressively throughout the year does not work. Uh, we've run into that problem with many um, different uh, issues. Uh, Representative Fagan will know that, um, you know, for example, with the National Guard, this fall tuition that we'd like to help um, pay for and this spring tuition. Well, the spring tuition doesn't happen until after December 30th, so that's not an eligible use. So we've run into that um, with many, many different um, issues that just can't all be dealt with in the next five months, uh, but are worthy causes nonetheless. So we would need um, the thumbs up from um, Congress or from the U.S. Treasury uh, that would say that we could use this money past December 30th. Marty, do can you I just, I just out of clarity, it's not the 30th, it's the 20th, I believe. So we have to be really careful about that. Yeah, the I COVID think the 20th down. is self-imposed. I think 30th. Right. The state of the, the 20, oh, the 30th, not the 31st. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, Meta, and then we'll move down to Janet. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Adam, still within the list for the waterfall, um, could you talk to us a little bit about number four, the statewide grant portal, and what that's all about as contrasted with say the statewide business portal? Right, so actually I think, um, you know, this year is, perfectly representative, representative of the fact that um, we would benefit, I think, um, dramatically from having one uh, granting, uh, call it, mechanism um, so that grants that are issued to uh, farmers or working lands would be the same grants that would be issued to the Vermont Mountain Biking Association, or they would all go through the same portal uh, for um, acceptance or for application. Um, it, it, you know, maybe in past years, it, it wasn't obvious that this would be needed. I think this year has uh, represented to us that it is an obvious need. Uh, um, that it would make it far more efficient for us to have kind of one portal through which all grant applications would be viewed. And, and this would include the, the various grant applications, it, for instance, through ACCD and all, all the rest of these yes, uh, that's grants, awesome. which we have, yeah, all yep. grants. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Representative Ansel. Hey, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of fairly specific questions and then one general one. Um, there were a couple of changes that the tax department uh, recommended last session that we passed in the House, but that haven't made it through the Senate. Um, one having to do with the rent or rebate program and another having to do with changes in the use tax table. Um, and I'm wondering whether those continue to be a uh, priority of the administration um, or sort of what their status is. And then my more general question, I'll just get them all out and then I'll mute myself. My more general question has to do with the education fund and whether you will be making recommendations at some point to uh, deal with the uh, uh, gap, the projected gap in the education fund. 
so with uh, rent and rebate and use tax, um, they are uh, still priorities for the administration. I think uh, Commissioner Bolio will be very happy to come in and talk about those, uh, but there hasn't been a change there. Adam, um, we're losing in, you. In terms of the head, I'm sorry? Your, your voice went okay. there. Sorry. Um, there hasn't been uh, a change in the administration's um, request or, or um, desire to, uh, to uh, kind of bring the rent or rebate program into a more usable fashion. And I, I think uh, Ways and Means, what they heard from the administration in January, um, we stand behind that, um, similar with use tax tables. And I think Commissioner Bolio would be very happy to come in and talk to you about that. Um, in terms of the education fund, um, I don't have my... Anyway, okay. Yep, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, in terms of the education fund, I don't have in my back pocket a proposal um, to deal with that. I would note, however, um, that uh, the deficit they were looking at is substantially smaller than what we were looking at earlier this year. Um, and um, we uh, intend to uh, work with the legislature on that. Um, we also are um, anxiously waiting for um, perhaps changes at the federal level that will um, make that uh, deficit uh, less onerous. There's um, still ESSER money that could well find its way into the um, education fund that I think would make the deficit substantially lower. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Janet. Um, Representative Kornheiser. Thanks. Hi, Adam. Hello. I am curious if you could tell me a little bit about this $2 million in economic stimulus equity and what that means. So, and I think um, the answer is this is a conversation that should be a broader conversation between the administration and the legislature. Um, but there were um, various um, residents in Vermont um, who did not qualify for the economic stimulus grants uh, uh, that uh, uh, were sent out to many people. Um, and you know, we acknowledge that. Um, and I think um, something that we need to, to work on. Um, so we wanted to put some money in the budget. The governor was very concerned uh, to put some money in the budget. Um, and because we didn't come to you with all the answers, but um, we're looking to develop a program. Um, and we thought it would be appropriate if this is something that's important to the governor, he should put some money in the budget. So that's what he did. Um, but he's predominantly a way to reach out um, to a larger audience for uh, economic stimulus. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Emily, um, we have Representative Conquest and then Representative Hooper, your hand is new again, right? Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you. Um, Adam, I just had a little clarification. Um, so you had said earlier that there was the uh, agency of ag was looking for uh, in their request for CRF funds um, $400,000 to administer those four um, grant programs that fall into their jurisdiction. And then when Meta asked you about the, um, the agency of administration's $2.2 million for um, administering grants. Um, she mentioned ACCD, but it, it sounded to me like you were saying that would that would cover sort of grant funding generally. And I'm just wondering, are those, are, are, is that, are we two, two pots of money to do the same work or was, is the agency of ag just completely separate, not included under the agency of administration's grant portal? No, um, so, and thank you for that, actually. If I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. No, the um, starting with the Agency of Agriculture, um, there is a request in the documents, um, in the language that you see in front of you, uh, uh, for coronavirus funds for the Agency of uh, Agriculture, Food and Markets. Uh, the total request is about a little over $1.5 million. Uh, approximately 1.3 million of that uh, is to help them run the programs um, that they are overseeing. There are, I think, four different grant programs that were in H960 
fix or S351, I believe. Um, they were in the uh, coronavirus relief fund uh, bills that were passed. Uh, agriculture, for reasons that I can't tell you, um, was unlike the other uh, agencies and subrecipients like VITA or uh, EHCB, was not given um, permission or, or uh, authority to use some of the grant money for administrative expenses. So this would um, acknowledge the substantial administrative uh, expenses they have incurred in administering those grant programs um, by giving them a small amount. The uh, or $450,000 I mentioned would be um, the amount of that 1.5 million that would be used as a general fund offset. So that would, you would notice a, or will notice a decline of roughly $450,000. It normally would have been in the ag budget um, because those are staff and resources that are typically uh, budgeted for various agricultural pursuits uh, that are being substantially devoted um, uh, to uh, COVID response, specifically economic grants. But the grant portal that I referred to is something entirely different. It, th that's um, to set up a way to kind of funnel all grant applications, including agriculture and ANR and, and human services and the like through one portal. You know, there's, there's a procedure for applying for grants. Um, it's, you know, onerous to some, less onerous to others. Um, but this would allow us to kind of have one portal for application as opposed to as opposed to what it is now you know every agency and department does its own thing so but that is entirely separate from what i mentioned on ag so the the portal would be for non-crf grants well it would be for grants crf grants or otherwise okay all right thank you you're welcome uh, thank you, Chip. Uh, Mary? Thank you. Adam, you said something significant in response to a question from uh, Rep. Landfear early on, um, which I wanted to thank you for because there's been some uneasiness among folks out there. And you said we are committed to, in, in reference to the um, state employee contract, you said we are committed to the agreement that we signed. And I think right. there has been some concern that, that there might be an interest in renegotiating that. So I was really happy to hear you say that. And I just wanted to acknowledge Thank that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Um, I'm interested that you that th th there is this proposal to spend $6 million in general fund dollars for what has traditionally been funded by transportation funds. And I'm curious if this is a new philosophy that we should be spending GF money in over in transportation. And that's, that's a fair comment. Um, you know, I think I think that the various um, kind of um, downward trends and then reversal and upward trend um, with revenues um, and various funding sources have been more of a general fund phenomenon. The T fund, um, I think, uh, has. Um, quite as favored in that regard. Um, and yet they have, you know, like many agencies in government, they have expenses that just keep that, you know, you need to pay. Either you pay a dollar today or you can end up paying a dollar fifty tomorrow. And with many of our maintenance tasks, um, you know, when you're low on cash, that you postpone them um, and it comes back to bite you. And so we're we're trying to acknowledge that you know some of these needs regardless of which fund is is paying them um, are uh, important and you know I think the governor took to heart the fact that you know he's he's on the roads probably more than most and he sees the work that needs to be done um, but our intention is not the uh, you know to make this a trend I think it's just an acknowledgement that 
you know, the general fund ended up in a better shape than the uh, T fund, and we have expenses in the T fund that we need to meet. Um, I would not anticipate seeing this uh, very frequently in future budgets. I appreciate that. I, I'm kind of interested in the priorities for spending that money, um, roadside mowing versus some of the other issues that we generally apply general fund dollars toward. But that's our process. We'll sort it out. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Diane? Thank you. So following in that same vein, so $6 million, and if I'm understanding this correctly, Adam, we were, you were, the administration was so comfortable with where they were with all of the rest of the general fund funding of state government that they could say, you know what, we're so okay, we can give $6 million over to transportation projects, which I'm, I'm not just, are not a, not a bad thing. It's just, um, I'm just even just starting to get the initial of where some of the balancing came to make some of that come about. And I can't imagine that the conversation wasn't there that didn't say that, you know, there are things and what's blatant here is like the uh, Vermont State Colleges, but I'm sure there are other things that were maybe didn't make your waterfall list that are not happening, uh, that are not occurring. Um, and what that $6 million is being moved away from for this instead of that. And I think that's the part of what we're gonna have to figure out. Somewhere there's something that's not getting funded that we may, we may not totally agree with on, on that particular use. And I'm not able to see it as clearly right now with these documents where that uh, shift occurred. But I would say looking at if you felt comfortable enough with the general fund to have such excess that we could do this, that I should not find any other places that have anything diminished. Well, you know, I, I think it's a prioritization. I mean, I, I would just say that, um, that, you know, there are, you're right. I mean, the, the, there are all kinds of ways we could spend $6 million, but, you know, I think the governor is very, Kind of tuned into what he hears and sees, and you know we've received comments on um, our transportation maintenance areas, and we also we know that uh, I mean we postpone maintenance, and it just costs us more in the future. So we're just trying to keep up with it. And you know I think your comments are are right on. I mean what you spend on one thing, you're not spending on another. Um, but you know it was a prioritization. Thank you, Diane. Diane, were you finished? Thank you, Adam. Yes, thank you. Adam, I just have a couple of quick questions on the direct applications to the general fund. You went over um, most of them, and I'm assuming um, the unclaimed property, that that's a number that came in after the legislature. Because we have an updated number in June, and this is an additional 1.4 that the treasurer's office has identified. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. That's right. So, okay. I just wanted to, to make sure. And then on that, on, on your uh, direct applications, you, you show $3 million from the State Healthcare Resources Fund. Could you comment on um, how that, you, where that $3 million, uh, how it became available? I knew there would be a reason to ask Matt to help me out on this. <laughs> 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 and here it is. Can, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. We heard uh, you first. So uh, as you'll recall, uh, the majority of the uh, sources of revenue that used to go into the state healthcare resources fund um, is now directed uh, into the general fund. Uh, however, there was a balance in the state healthcare resources fund at that time. And uh, the decision was made to leave that balance uh, in the state healthcare resources fund uh, just in case when we made the transfer, we were somehow leaving the Agency of Human Services short on that special fund source. Uh, well, after that was done and the dust all cleared, there still was a uh, meaningful balance in, the, in that fund. And so uh, by direct dapping it uh, into the general fund, uh, we can use it and uh, ultimately you know, I think Adam mentioned that, you know, Medicaid trend was, um, is expected to be up by $15 million. So ultimately that, that 
general fund support will make its way back to AHS, but uh, from a mechanical standpoint, it's being transferred uh, from the state healthcare resources fund to the um, to the general fund. And when the cent when we take testimony from the central office, we can dive deeper into that. Thank right. you, Matt. Um, and then my last question: um, you you talked about the five percent um, targeted savings for BTS and ADS across um, you know across all departments. Um, we also heard about a 3%. Can you, Adam, can you highlight where some 3% um, targeted savings may have been achieved that, that you haven't spoken to? Well, there were um, many departments that put forward savings plans. I mean, to highlight um, one in particular, ANR, um, that has done a fair amount of, um, of analysis into its departmental operations, um, DEC and Fish and Wildlife and FPR, uh, all of them. And, uh, you know, they, they put forward a savings plan um, that was actually originally in excess of, of 3% um, and then kind of dialed it back and fine tuned. Um, but, you know, there, yeah, there's one department that I think is, is uh, appropriate to highlight um, as, you know, having achieved what we asked and, um, you know, they would say that it, it took a fair amount of work, but um, we're no worse for it. And, and was it a broad 3% or is ANR the, the poster child here? No, we, it, every department showed some savings, some more than others. Okay. It, you can't just go to every department and say, I want 3%, um, right. you know, it just never mathematically it's hard to make that work and frankly it's it's it ends up um, you know every budget has to have certain priorities in it but you know statewide we um, are actually slightly below three percent statewide but keep in mind that part of the budget is uh, off limits I mean we don't touch our retirement obligations we don't touch our debt service so really uh, when you um, need to reduce overall spending by 3% um, and you take out what amounts to $300 million off the table, uh, that kind of increases the amount that every department has to save by quite a bit more than that. Um, but it's very hard to be precise with every department. We just like to, we prefer to say statewide, there was a little more than actually 2% savings. I, I'm just thinking plan testimony on this very limited time yeah. schedule. I mean, we're on a a tight time schedule, uh, who we need to have in. So how, you know, to understand the 3%, um, whether it's um, the Council on the Arts or the Vermont Symphony Orchestra, or, you know, some of those other entities that are funded through uh, the general fund. Um, right. So you will we'll soon see a list of, if there's reductions like with the Vermont Symphony Orchestra, Yes, you will. Um, as a general rule, um, the uh, symphony orchestra, the historical society, the humanities council, the arts council, they all, um, you know, um, gave us savings. Uh, we asked them to, and they, you know, I, I take actually, interestingly, I take my hat off to them. You know, there was no mourning and groaning. They knew we had financial issues. And um, so, yes, they all provided savings for us. Thank you. That's what I needed to know for testimony. Thank you. Any final questions? We have uh, Dave and Mary. Yes, uh, I just wanted to follow up on that last comment you made, uh, Kitty. Uh, did, is it unreasonable to ask for some type of spreadsheet to just list all those uh, reductions? And if not too hard, if there's any corresponding federal funds that are lost because of the general fund uh, reduction. It might it just might help expedite things. A lot of it might be self-explanatory. I presume the departments have already done that for someone, and if they could just uh, collate it into one. But if that's unreasonable, given our uh, time frame, I understand. We're going to have to find it anyways, because our members will probably ask us of that. Thank you. Is there a question, Adam, that you have, or is it, this is something that we would need to um, develop on our side? I think the departments can share with you the information they have. I have I don't have something at my fingertips that I'm um, thank I you can share. Um, Diane. Nope, you're done. I don't see any other uh, questions. Uh, are there any final Chair Toll? 
Yes. Oh, Chair Toll, this is Suzanne Young. I've, I've joined by phone, so I've um, had a chance to, to listen to some of the hearing. Uh, with your permission, uh, I'd like to perhaps clarify um, the answer for, for Representative Hooper about the contract. Certainly, and, and I'm sorry I didn't recognize, I don't see the whole phone number. I wouldn't have recognized it, but uh, Secretary. That's okay. I, I'm sorry I couldn't join from the beginning, but um, so uh, Representative Hooper, I know you asked about the um, contract and and I just wanted to clarify so, so um, it's clear that the administration um, did enter into a two-year contract with the DSCA last fall, and we did support full funding of that two-year contract um, before adjournment. And the legislature, as, as you may recall, only funded the first year of the contract. And that first year was um, one-time payments to state employees, um, which we uh, did honor and immediately paid um, um, in the first pay period of July 1st of, of this fiscal year. Um, but because the legislature did not fund the full pay act by operation of law, that contract goes back to bargaining. So, you know, we and the legislature took a wait and see attitude, I think because of all the uncertainty around the virus, around our, our revenues and around um, what would be available for, for funding that um, in the next fiscal year. So, um, we're, uh, I believe the BSC understands that we're going um, back to negotiations after um, adjournment and before um, this fall, and that we will have um, something that we both support um, to you in, in the January um, budget. So, so that's kind of the status of, of the contract. I just wanted to make sure, we, you know, if we can support the deal um, that we negotiated with the funding and the situation that faces us uh, come the fall as we're at the bargaining table, we certainly do support the deal that we entered with the, the contract last year subject to, to um, available funds and, and pay act appropriation. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, could you make one clarification? You said that um, since we took a wait and see pro approach and only funded the first year of the Pay Act and not the, the full two year contract that it automatically opened up negotiations. Does it automatically open up negotiations or does it allow for negotiations to be opened if you choose to? Well, I believe that um, by operation of law that there is technically not a contract so I mean, we will have to go back and um, at least discuss, if not, you know, and, and negotiate a, a contract for, for a year or two. So that's my understanding from, from your ledge counsel's advice to the committee. But Mary? Well, actually, that was not our interpretation of our okay. council's advice and uh, not our intention. I, I, I think I'm not just speaking for myself, but I think in terms of what our committee's understanding was that was that we were taking a wait and see um, position and uh, but not to be opening up the contract again. Um, well, I guess then that's certainly uh, that certainly then I guess is subject to to interpretation that is, you know, is not um, um, how we have understood uh, the action of waiting and staying and not expressing an intent to, to fund the pay act. So, I mean, it's something that we'll, we'll have to work through, but I just wanted, you know, to clarify that, that it was not funded and we, um, you know, are going to be sitting down with, with the BSEA um, this fall and, and looking at available uh, resources to, um, fund um, the deal and and whether there need to be any adjustments made with them and I'm sure that we'll I'm sure that we'll have a um, a fruitful conversation then and and we'll see the consequence of that in the 22 budget that would be our intent yes yeah that I think that was our intent too that we funded okay. in the 22 budget um, not that the contract be renegotiated but that we address this in 22 not before then. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate the clarification of, of, of your understanding. Thank you. Are there other questions? 
Uh, Secretary Young, did you want to comment on any other parts of, of, the pre of your proposal, of the proposal from the administration? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think Commissioner Gresham um, did a good job uh, covering a lot of ground in a short time, and there'll be plenty of time, I think, for further discussion and <laughs> clarifications as you guys roll up your sleeves and dive in. We thank you for your time today. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining us. We can't see you, but we can hear you. So thank you for uh, coming on to the, the call. Uh, there's thank just you. A, couple of, um, a couple of pieces wanted to clarify that. Do you want to join us? Sure, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Very quickly, I don't want to keep you, but uh, I think there's some technical issues that uh, may be helpful for you all to bear in mind as you uh, dive in. Uh, you know, we were really in unprecedented uh, and uncharted territory in trying to uh, approach the, the restatement budget. And so the approach that we worked out um, uh, in consensus with JFO is that we would introduce to you a bill that covers the entirety of FY21. So um, I, I try to correct people uh, uh, in my side of the house when they refer to it as a three-quarter bill because you will not be receiving a three-quarter bill. You will be receiving a full full year appropriations for all departments. Um, so in in some cases, those will uh, uh, override the quarter appropriation that you already uh, did. Um, and it makes it a little bit complicated. Uh, we are working from the GovRec as the starting point. Uh, departments will be presenting to you uh, what we call a budget addendum, which will look like an ups and downs, and it will be only changes from the GovRec. Um, so we, we ask that if, if you can get access to your GovRec materials uh, for departmental hearings, um, that will form the decisions that we recommended to you um, through January. And then there will be a, a short material in departments that could be just as simple as one page that identifies the changes from that. And those two combined will generate what their, the department's annual appropriation will be. Uh, on the language side, and you're working off the January proposal. We're working off of the January proposal, exactly. Um, and it sometimes gets a little bit uh, tricky uh, for the things that were appropriated either in part or in whole in the um, first quarter bill. Uh, but we've tried to address those clearly in the restatement so that it either uh, overrides, uh, so that you can cl clearly see whether it overrides or not what was done in the. Um, Q1 bill. From a language standpoint, uh, same thing. We will be, the language document that we posted to you uses GovRec as a starting point. If you see items that are shaded out in gray in the, in the, in that document, that means that those are things that since that time we have removed um, and um, we are no longer requesting. Uh, whereas uh, blue are new items that we have added since GovRec, um, and white just means that we are sticking with our original GovRec proposal. And hopefully that'll be more clear to you um, as you look at it, but we think that the approach with the language and the numbers is the one, it was certainly the, the most expedient on our end, and we think you'll find it's the most expedient on your end as well. Okay, so white are your original proposals from January. Anything in blue is new and anything in gray is something you put out in January, but they're off the table. Correct, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we are at 2.30. Is there a final question for either the commissioner or Secretary Young or for Matt Riven? Thank you uh, for, for coming in. We look forward to uh, our work with you and, and we know it's going to be quick. Um, compared to our normal budgeting process and um, looking at the schedule that Teresa has put forward, um, they're going to be jam-packed days. So we look forward to keeping communications open and, and finding a spot that we all can agree on. It's going to be quick, Madam Chair, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that, Adam. <laughs> okay. Take care, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank and you. Ways and means could stay on. Uh, we had scheduled just 15 minutes so that um, 
it's our only way really to connect with one another about what the priorities are. And with your committee, obviously it's the, uh, the two tax credits that you will be talking about. But are there any uh, points as we are working through our testimony that you would like to make sure that we get clarification on or things that you're concerned about before we get a recommendation back? Janet, it's the downtown uh, village tax credit and the military pension tax credit. Were there any other pieces that were directly related that you would? Um, so, so it's interesting that um, those two tax credits, we actually did take action on in the house um, before we left. Um, and um, at least our committee had taken action on them. We supported the downtown credit and we didn't uh, recommend the military credit. Um, the, the other two issues that come to my mind uh, quick, uh, you know, actually there's several, but the two that I mentioned, the use tax change in the use tax table had a million dollar uh, impact uh, down. Um, we think it's an important thing to do. It's um, in the miscellaneous tax bill and the Senate has not acted on it, um, but it does have a budget impact, um, but it's an important policy change. And the other uh, work that we spent a lot of time on was the rental rebate changes. And I, 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 someone on my committee can remind me, I don't think that had a fiscal impact um, the first in, for fiscal uh, 21, um, but it, it had a potential out year impact. I mean, it, it was a, a real restructuring of the program, but that passed the house and it's sitting in the Senate. Um, so that's another, another fairly important um, piece. The community high school of Vermont, we've talked oh, about. That's right, that, that is certainly <laughs> one. And um, we didn't recommend it. Um, we also glad that, not speaking for myself and uh, glad that Kino's off the table. There are other changes I see in the lottery that I uh, think um, might uh, bear some attention and time. Um, anyone on my committee want to jump in with some things that I've forgotten? Just jump right in. Don't if you have thoughts or comments. Janet, I have a question about the downtown tax credit. Um, Adam's number, I think I'm looking for it was 1.3 million. Yeah, we, I don't think we recommended, I think we recommended uh, 400,000. Uh, uh, can someone remind me on the committee? Sam was the reporter for the bill and I'm just not remembering for sure. I don't think we recommend, I don't think we recommended the entire thing. I think what we recommended was that we uh, change, that we increase the credit to a $3 million a year program. I think it's currently 2.6. That's right, yeah. And I think we went to three, um, which frankly, I think is a good, good uh, whether we can afford to increase it this year is a separate question, but I do think 3 million is a good target for it. And that was a $400,000? I think so. I think it's, I think it's okay. two six right now. And I think it uh, went to three. Um, and so uh, obviously you'll be following what the Senate does with the renter rebate since we've already passed it out of the house and, um, the um, the use <clears throat> the use tax um, changes. The, yeah, I I suspect that million dollars is not a. Although Adam said they continue to support it, my guess is it's not accommodated in the budget that you were just presented. Um, so that is a million dollar um, negative. And if we make the change. Negative change. Yeah. Although I think it's you know there's there's a uh, timing issue and a few other issues, but basically. Uh, the use tax table that we have is is much higher than it should be. The, the so-called safe harbor for taxpayers is higher than it should be because most people pay the sales tax when they buy something online um, now with the changes in Wayfair. So it's really not, it's not fair to taxpayers the way it's structured now. And you will take a position on the, the lottery policy, your committee? Um, I, well, you know, Often that has been general committee and our committee. I think general is the policy committee on uh, gambling and lottery. So mm -hmm. they may take the lead on it. But, uh, 
there, there were no estimates of. And I don't think they put any money in, no, um, on any of those changes. So, um, so it may be more of a policy question. But. Thank you, Janet. Any final? Uh, well, uh, let me, I've got some committee members here. I think I've got five or six of them. Uh, anybody come up with something that I've forgotten? No, no. Um, Mary has a question or a comment? Yeah. I, I'm a huge fan of the downtown tax credit and so was appreciative of what you did. I just had to shake my head at this proposal in this year. I, I cannot imagine, I, I sure wish that folks were going to be building and be able to take advantage of the tax credits, but it just doesn't make sense to me. And so I just wanted to offer my opinion since I have a chance to right now. I mean, but we haven't talked about it as a committee, but yeah. that would be an easy thing to go to 3 million next year. Do yeah. it now, but change it um, later. Yeah. Have the change and, to protect later. And, and the other thing that is, is in your jurisdiction, I guess, is this proposal to use general fund. I, I, we can certainly use general fund dollars in the trans to buy transportation stuff, but to me, that asks an interesting question, which lies in your realm. And I just wanted to highlight that again. I, as you know, we wrestle over tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands and for 6 million to be just kind of shipped off to the transportation realm. Um, yeah, I th I, I'm guessing, I mean, because the, it's really a question of where the money goes, which is more of an appropriation question than a revenue question. Um, I, uh, uh, we can look at it if, if your committee wants us to, but I think it would be really health transportation and, and, um, and house appropriations that would sort that out. The reason I was connecting it with you is the alternative obviously is if there is a need in that realm, exactly. there's yeah. another way to find the funds. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Right. Yeah, we get more involved in the education fund because there's an immediate impact on property taxes. So there's, you know, on education fund issues, it really, it, it sort of, um, turns in, into a property tax issue um, whenever we make changes. That's not true with the transportation uh, fund. We would have to I see. I see. Thank you. So uh, Janet, if at um, your convenience, but also rather quickly, if, if we could just have an informal letter from Ways and Means and so, you know, we don't need all the formal language or citing, you know, just the broad topics, what you agree with, uh, what you're watching to pass. And if it doesn't pass, if there's, you know, another swipe in, of it through the budget, if yeah. we could um, get a memo from your committee on these topics, that would be, that would be wonderful. Yeah, and thank you. Yeah, happy to do that. And um, I went through the language as I was listening and I think I picked up what, what looked to me like ways and means issues. Um, but as I keep saying, I'm, I may have missed something, in which case, well, you let me know or I'll figure it out. We do not have time to get letters out to every committee. So this is why we're really yeah. joined. And yeah. Bob will follow up with transportation and, and Mary has an interest as we all do on the use of that $6 million. And if you wanna weigh in or you, you find yeah. you should be yeah. weighing, please do that. Um, uh, thank you to you and to your committee for joining us. I think this is yeah. expedite, expedite right. the process. Thank you. So we'll say goodbye. Enjoy your day. Jump right into military. At, uh, okay, so uh, Madam Chair, this means yeah. that we need to end this one. Everybody needs to go to the next link. Okay, I but email. Theresa, Theresa? Yeah. Uh, it is 2.43. I'm going to give the committee a five-minute break. We all need to stand up and walk around, so we're it's going fine. to... I'm just going to...